description. There we go. So welcome everyone. My name is Michael Gummel from Paradigm Technology Consulting. And with me today is Ruff, Russ Graff and Tom Wilson from NetStock. Uh, we have muted everyone. But please feel to you feel free to use the chat to ask questions, and we'll also leave some time at the end for questions as well. So today, Russ will be taking us through a conversation about how you can accelerate your business with a powerful inventory solution, and then Tom will show us uh, the actual product. With today's supply chain issues, it's more important than ever to have a good handle on your inventory. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, I have an ERP system and I track my inventory through it. Well, that's a start, but often not enough. By the end of today's session, you will understand why you need an inventory optimization, forecasting, demand planning, and replenishment tool. And with that, I will pass it over to Russ to take it away. Hey, great. Thank you. I appreciate it, Michael, and appreciate uh, everybody at Paradigm that uh, assisted in getting this uh, together and giving us the opportunity. Thank you, all of those of you who are in attendance or maybe viewing this via recording later. Uh, appreciate you taking some time out of your day to learn a little bit more about what is really a compelling issue in today's world for any inventory-based business. So we're calling this uh, presentation, Make Better Inventory Decisions uh, with NetStock and with Paradigm Technology. Uh, as as uh, Michael mentioned, my name is Russ Graff. I have the honor of being vice president in charge of channel management and strategic relationships for NetStock. Uh, and of course, Paradigm is one of those key relationships for us. Michael and Paradigm have been fans of ours, friends of ours for a number of years, and we really appreciate that uh, ongoing support. And again, the opportunity to present to you here today. So a quick agenda. I'm just going to cover a couple of key topics uh, before we turn it over to Tom for a product demo. There are some issues and trends going on in the, in the world today that I just want to highlight a couple of things regarding. We'll talk about what it looks like to build a resilient supply chain and, and do some becoming more agile and flexible in our management of that, uh, look at some predictive uh, insights that we can garner out of the data that we capture and so forth. And then we'll, uh, as I mentioned, turn it over to Tom Wilson for a product demo and walk you through some live screens and show it to you. So with that, let's go ahead and, and dig in. So, uh, you know, today's issues are really no different than they've been for a long time in supply chain, but they're, I think they're just a little more extreme, right? We've always had challenges of balancing uh, the level of inventory so that we have enough, but not too much. Right, kind of a Goldilocks sort of uh, desire that we have there. So uh, unfortunately, we have plenty of stock outs, uh, uh, especially today in, in uh, the supply chain disruptions that we're facing. We'll talk more about that. So, But even while we have some items stocking out, uh, we have other items that we probably have in excess because we've got such volatile demand, right? So we've got too much stuff sitting on the shelf, tying up capital in some, uh, either in some locations or in some product lines or some individual SKUs. Uh, but yet also stocking out and losing sales in other areas. So very expensive to our firms, very detrimental to our profitability of our firms if we don't get this right, or at least as close to right as possible. And the reality is that the folks that are responsible for managing this balancing act in our organizations tend to spend way too much time messing with numbers, right? Trying to figure out what to order, what's actually on hand, what does that demand really look like? Uh, when our purchase order is coming in, what's, you know, what does that look like? Uh, and, and typically trying to do it with spreadsheets, or you may be uh, using consultants at Paradigm to help you uh, write custom reports or dump data into a BI tool or dump data into Excel or SQL uh, tables and try to do all your own massaging and, and, and mathematics and so forth. So, so we find those folks spending way too much time being data jockeys and messing with those reports and numbers instead of really doing the higher value things that are required now of supply chain managers and buyers and planners in our organizations, right? Managing those transportation costs and so forth. So, so if we can make us more efficient in this area, uh, you know, that's going to have a huge impact on our ability to, to stay ahead of the curve and manage all the volatility. Uh, and then the fourth factor, of course, has to do with forecasting accuracy. It's always been a challenge. There's no such thing as a perfect forecast. It's always a best guess, but the more accurate you can be, the better your results are going to be in terms of your performance and knowing what to what to order and when to order it and so forth. So, so you know, again, those issues are not new. Uh, they've been exacerbated uh, dramatically uh, by the, the COVID pandemic over the last couple of years now, over two years. 
Uh, and it doesn't look like it's going to get any better anytime soon, right? The supply chain disruption that we're experiencing is really not going anywhere for at least another year, probably two. Uh, I have the opportunity many times to speak with different thought leaders and industry analysts and so forth uh, and kind of get their opinion. And the prevailing wisdom really is at best, we're looking at Q2 next year, so a year from now before things begin to really return to some level of normalcy. But many folks think that that's even optimistic, that we're probably looking at, at you know, the end of 2023, maybe Q1 of 2024 before things settle down a little bit. Obviously, predicting is difficult. It could get worse before it gets better. Uh, but we certainly are experiencing very long lead times. Uh, and part of it is certainly pandemic related uh, because of uh, all the disruption, right? As we uh, speak. seven or eight weeks. And that is a critical port coming out of Asia with a huge number of electronics components coming out of that space, uh, in, including um, uh, integrated circuits, right? Um, microchips uh, that uh, uh, are critically in shortage and are you know prevalent in so many different products. We've all seen articles and seen the news recently where major automakers had to shut down assembly lines and slow down production for lack of a microchip because of all the sensors that are in cars now and so forth. So, so that's a real challenge that, that's not going away. And it tends to be sort of a whack-a-mole environment, right? It, Shanghai may reopen up and then it'll uh, appear somewhere else where there's another lockdown or another challenge. So, so we're gonna have to de deal with this for a long time to come, I'm afraid. Uh, and so those increasing stockouts and rising costs that have resulted from that, right? Transportation costs have gone through the roof. That was also something that was occurring uh, before COVID, but but got uh, you know much worse for us. I mean, there's some some transportation costs are now 10x what they were a couple of years ago. All the disruption as well, um, and uh, you know, and now we we add to it the the war in Ukraine, uh, which just you know, regardless of all the, the just the human horror of of the war and all the all, all the issues that way, there is a supply chain impact. Uh, unfortunately, because uh, there's a lot of key components that come out of that region and sanctions on Russia that we're going to they're going to prevent uh, any products coming in from there. So, uh, you know, we're in a global environment. It's a very global, very interconnected supply chain. So any of those kinds of disruptions in any region around the world uh, have ripple effects uh, throughout. Um, and I, I think just the other day I saw that Harley Davidson was shutting down production for a couple of weeks in two different plants for lack of a component. So it's gonna to continue to be forefront in the news uh, and a challenge for all of our organizations. Um, and as I mentioned, there were already certain trends that were occurring within our supply chain prior to the pandemic hitting. Um, there was already a movement to try to simplify uh, our supply chains um, and, uh, and bring some manufacturing and assembly work back closer to the US shores, uh, right? Either near shoring or onshoring is the term you'll hear. So that was already a trend uh, and uh, that has been accelerated because of the, especially the transportation challenges and port challenges that we experience. Um, we're certainly, you know, we've seen the, the government make a big investment now in our infrastructure here, and that's gonna impact ports and airports and, and other transportation modes, rail lines and so forth, which is gonna make it more efficient and effective for us to do uh, onshore uh, manufacturing. So we're gonna see a continuing trend that way which, you know, regardless of any political perspectives, I think is a good thing. But the impact on us as suppliers is we now have to make adjustments to our lead times and to our relationships with our suppliers. It has impact, right? It has a ripple effect. So any of these changes mean we have to react and do something about it. Uh, it overall, the digitization of the supply chain, right? The, the, uh, one of the results of, of uh, COVID is that really accelerated this because of all the remote work. So now we're all working remotely and, and trying to share data and, and needing to manage data and understand the data better and then, and then use that for uh, collaboration with our suppliers <clears throat> and with our top customers and so forth. So that was again, a trend that was already in place that has, has dramatically increased and is not gonna change, right? We've seen the value of that now. Um, and then, you know, the case for the, what we call su supply chain sustainability, um, you know, how do we put in, uh, buffers and safeties and, and levers within our supply chain to give us some risk mitigation 
uh, capability, right? How do we sustain and manage through disruption? Uh, and one, a little sidebar to that is this concept of ESG. We're starting to see a little bit more of that in the news now, uh, but the concept of environmental, social, and governance impacts. Uh, so if you as a company are supplying uh, publicly traded companies or perhaps you know, other big box, uh, major retailers and so forth, you can expect that you're going to get, uh, if not audited, certainly asked about what the nature of your supply chain is as it relates to these areas, right? Are, are you comfortable that your company and your suppliers to your company have met proper environmental uh, uh, aspects, right? Things that people are looking at with climate change or looking at carbon footprint and uh, all those kinds of uh, factors. So, you know, do you have an understanding of what that looks like in your supply chain? Also, the social issues are around uh, uh, labor laws and uh, all those kinds of things and, and uh, compliance to all kinds of other social um, uh, standards now that have become prevalent, especially with younger generations now becoming more uh, prevalent in decision making roles, right? Millennials uh, and Gen Xers and so forth have, have grown up with a more of a social consciousness and some of us uh, baby boomers have. And so this is going to become more prevalent. So we need to really be aware ability to those things so that when we get asked about it yet we can feel comfortable uh, that we're that we're uh, you know in, in a good position there and then we hear the phrase resilient supply chain as well right um, and I really like this phrase because if, if we if we agree that the disruptions aren't going anywhere right the challenges are going to remain these trends that are in place are going to accelerate then then we then we understand that it's not an issue of of when or if it's it's how do we deal with the changes right how do we become resilient so recognize that these challenges exist they're going to continue to exist so therefore let's build some resiliency into our supply chain uh, which again means dealing with risk factors how do we mitigate against potential disruptions right let's think ahead and say what if this would happen or that would happen who predicted that a, a freighter would go sideways in the suez canal a year ago uh, and stay there for weeks at a time and disrupt uh, incredibly uh, the overall global supply chain for any products coming out of the Mediterranean. Um, and uh, so, you know, we now have a position where we can just kind of say to ourselves, let's expect weird things to happen, strange things to happen, disruptions to occur. And what can we do about that? How do we manage those issues? And you know, we have multiple suppliers in different parts of the world coming through different ports. Uh, that I can switch to and manage uh, uh, those relationships if, if I need to? How can we build other redundancy into our systems? How can we be more dynamic in the way that we manage uh, key levers like safety stock parameters and lead times uh, and so forth that, that consistently change on us, right? So how can we build redundancy into our environment to manage those risks? And then what other what if scenario planning can we do with whether on the supply side or on the demand side you know what are the, all those potential uh, uh areas where we have some risk and where if we get ahead of the curve we can be ready when things when happen right uh, and a lot of that has to do with visibility in our into our supply chain and having the proper tools and technology and so forth a lot of times when i talk about uh, best practices in a supply chain environment we kind of break it into a couple of key areas where we talk about people, processes, and technology. And certainly you've got to have the right of, of labor shortages and challenges and people moving around and really reevaluating their careers and so forth. There's a lot of burnout uh, right now in the supply chain world. Folks are really been struggling for a couple of years now with all these challenges and they're getting a little burnt out. Uh, and we're seeing that and we're getting feedback from from our supply chain customers and uh, others in the industry that this is a real challenge so how do we deal with that how do we train them up how do we give them a work-life balance uh give and, and part of that is to give them good processes right and you've already made an investment in a dynamics erp which does a great job of capturing all the data uh, and it's a huge foundation for success uh, but it doesn't go quite far enough as, as Michael sort of alluded to, and we'll show you in those areas where, where it falls short. Uh, and so how can we supply our people with good processes that follow these strong ERP best practices, but then also augment that with good technology to give you the visibility and the other processes that you need to really manage 
all the volatility. So supplier performance is one of those areas where that's really important, right? Identifying where are you exposed? Where is their risk uh, across these suppliers? And, you know, maybe again, looking at different regions and looking at different ports that they might uh, leverage and different transportation modes that they use that could have their own risk factors. So how do I evaluate that? Um, and then as part of that solution, how do I uh, identify secondary suppliers for some key products, especially, right, key products uh, and materials that, that would be most at risk, make sure that you have a backup plan there. Uh, and not only that you have a plan, but that you use it on occasion, right? If I've identified a secondary supplier, I want to make sure that I actually place an order from them on occasion uh, so that I've got an under, I've got a relationship there. I understand what the process is. If there's certain forms or technologies, portals, whatever that might be, that I understand how to quickly swing into gear with that uh, backup supplier if I need to. And so I think it makes sense to purchase a few times a year from that supplier just to keep keep that uh, recognition there, right? Keep that awareness there. Um, and then other ways that you can just kind of improve that end-to-end -end visibility. We understand now that uh, I think I saw a report the other day that 70% of purchase order lines that are issued now will change multiple times before the product actually arrives at your dock. Um, so all those changes in lead times and expected delivery dates, how do I keep that visible to me? And how do I see what the impact of that is in terms of my buying requirements now to make sure that I'm covering, again, my risk and my safety stocks and so forth. So looking at where you it can really balance out that supplier environment to know that you have the right levels, uh, the right suppliers, some backups to key ones, but not too many as well. Right. Again, simplifying the supply chain, trying to keep things uh, a little bit more organized and compact so that, again, you can minimize the risk exposure there. So a couple of key things on the supply side. And then a couple final thoughts before we turn it over to Tom for a demo. You know, the same is true on the demand side. Uh, one of the reasons that the, we, uh, we've had the transportation challenges we have is because demand for many household products in particular have just gone through the roof for a variety of reasons. We don't need to necessarily get into that, but the demand has been insane for lots of different product lines. And it has created this incredible uh, uh, demand and shortage of uh, transportation uh, opportunities for us uh, and therefore prices have gone through the roof. So understanding the, the demand side and being able to be agile and flexible in managing the demand side and understanding the demand side of your environment has become really critical. So it's not just a supply issue, but it's also a demand issue and it really requires good data. You've really got to have uh, forecasting algorithms that are really sophisticated, but yet simple to use. Uh, and it sounds like counterintuitive, but but that does exist. In fact, we're going to show that to you, right? So understanding that data, having good data, being able to manage seasonality and 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 smooth weird spikes and dips that are going on, maybe being able to look at different periods of time as a baseline for what your future demand looks like, right? If we were to look at uh, a year ago, for example, depending on what business you're in, what markets you you serve. You might look at a year ago and look at your demand and go, well, that's not at all representative of what it is today. So why would I leverage that as a baseline, right, as a, as a, as a measuring point? So maybe it makes more sense to go back two years or maybe 18 months or three years. Use that set of data now as your baseline to predict future demand. So the ability to adjust and be flexible that way is critical. Um, and, and then managing by exception to so that, you know, the, the, the forecasts that are most out of whack and most challenged that are not performing uh, the, the most for you, uh, those are the ones you need to focus your time and energy on, right? You can't possibly look at every SKU and every product line and every location every single day. So help me find by a management by exception approach, maybe a dashboard uh, kind of model where I can really highlight, here's the key things that I need to focus on today that'll have the biggest impact on my profitability. And this is a key area for machine learning and, and some of those new technologies that are coming into play where I, I can really have some sensitivity to all those adjustments and let the machine, let, let the system uh, make adjustments for me and show me that information and make sure I validate it and so forth. So, so there's just so much that we can do on the demand side with data, sharing the data with your vendors, making sure they know what to expect, right? That's a great relationship and a great communication level that you can have with your suppliers so that they can anticipate what your needs are gonna be based on good data that you're providing to them. Uh, leveraging that data internally 
with your operations team and so forth to make sure that you're collaborating with all the different departments within your organization. And then really analyzing, understanding, do I need to have all the SKUs that I have? Do I really need to stock all those? We call it rationalizing your SKUs, right? So as an example here of Haynes Brands that recently cut 30% of their SKUs, prioritizing on the most efficient, the most profitable inventory. Well, th that's a lesson, right? We can all do that. Maybe there are some items that I can be vendor managed, that I can be drop shipped, that I don't need to stock. So analyzing and understanding the nature of the items, uh, and you'll see that in the NetStock application where we do some product classification, uh, is really helpful to understand, you know, how do I build policies now and processes and procedures around that understanding? So again, it all has to do with visibility and really knowing what's going on in your data and in your environment, in your supply chain. And then the last thing that that results in is your ability to do some nice predictive insight, right? Some nice what if planning, uh, some, some nice uh, modeling that you can do. So here's all this great data. Here's what we think is happening today, but here's what might happen. What if, right? And, and project that out over the course of the next six months, 12 months, even, even longer. If some of your products have lead times now that are extending beyond 12 months, which we have many customers that that's been a challenge for, right? So how do I go beyond even that to do some of that modeling, uh, do some what if, what would my future look like if I did this or if this occurred or if demand did thus or if supply did this? And, and so the ability to do that what if modeling helps you really make decisions again and understand the policies and make sure that your inventory policies are in compliance with corporate policy, right? How do we go to market? How do we make this work? What's our messaging to our customer? Are we one of those that talks about, you know, we have the, the biggest inventory in the, in the industry and we're, we can deliver in 48 hours. If that's your model, then what does that look like? How much safety stock, how much inventory do you have to carry to make that really happen for your customers? And is that the right policy? Does that really make sense? Is that going to be profitable for you? Uh, or something, something something less than that. So again, understanding the data, playing with the data, um, uh, modeling with the data, it's just gonna make all the difference in the world and your ability to be agile uh, and responsive to the ongoing and not ending anytime soon disruption that we have in the supply chains today. So hopefully that sets the stage a little bit, gets you thinking about some things. Maybe you see yourself in that picture a little bit that, yeah, this is a struggle. You know, I've got all this data in Excel and, uh, it, you know, it, it takes hours and hours for me to figure out what to buy. And, and, and there's no way I can do all that modeling. I'm lucky if I can get to it and keep it updated cleanly. Right. Uh, those kinds of things. So if you see yourself in that picture, uh, I think you'll be intrigued by what we have to show you here with the demo. So with Tom, I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to you and uh, let, let you show us some things in the NetStock application. OK. Hey, thanks, Russ. Hey, so uh, hello, everyone. As Russ said, my name is Tom Wilson. And I just pulled up a live instance of the NetStock planning solution. Um, and it is a cloud delivered service. And as Michael said earlier, your ERP system does a fantastic job keeping track of what your current inventory stocking levels are, open sales orders, purchase orders, and you absolutely need that transactional detail. But what your inventory should be is a different planning problem. And a lot of our customers are trying to do that with a spreadsheet. And it can be a daunting task trying to figure out what data I need, running uh, the forecasting engines that Russ talked about. Um, but just like a spreadsheet, there's certain information we need. We need to know what your stocking locations are. We need to know what your inventory stocking levels are. We need to know what's in stock, what's on order, who are your suppliers. But unlike a spreadsheet, we know exactly where to get that data. So NetStock will run on a NetStock server. We'll set up a connector through the internet to your ERP server, and then we'll set up a job. Typically every day, we'll get refreshes from your ERP. And then when you log into NetStock, you're logging in as a browser user. Now, because it is a connected service, you're always on the most current version of the software. In fact, um, we came up with a new user interface just last week. And what you're looking at is the new user interface that was rolled out to all of our customers just last week. Now, when you first log on to NetStock, you do see what is called a browser. And a browser is a high level summary, a summary of all the inventory at any given stocking location. Now I'm looking at a single stocking location, but if I toggle, I can look at other stocking locations, it just depends on how many you have. But again, the idea of NetStock is to show you what your current inventory is and recommend what it should be. 
And the dashboard is going to show you just that. It's going to show you what your current inventory is and some areas that might need sp specific attention. And it's laid out in several panels. Now, the first panel is called stock holding, and it shows that according to your ERP, right now you are carrying $8.7 million of inventory at your cost. Now the planning tool is highly scalable. We have customers with less than $100,000 of inventory planning. We've got customers with over 50 million. My demo database happens to have about 10 million just to give you a feel for the scale. But according to ERP, you're carrying 8.7 million against a recommendation of 5.9. 5.9 would be the optimal inventory given demand for the items, given lead time from your suppliers, given supplier performance, that would be your optimal inventory to fulfill your demand. I can see how my inventory has been trending over time. This is based on the last sync with your ERP, but based on the first time we loaded data, I was carrying 10.8. I can see how that's been trending. The top line shows my actual inventory against the medium line, the, the um, recommended inventory. I can see that how that's been trending. And the good news is we are trending in the right direction, but you still have more inventory than the planning tool is recommending. In fact, if I slide over to the next panel, you have some excess stock at this location. And right now there are 2,297 items in this stocking location that are in excess. And just the value of that excess inventory is costing your business $3 million. Now I can see that entire list. If I click there, I'll get an online report showing me every one of those 2,297 items. But as Russ said, we're, we want to bring to your exception, the exception to your attention, the exceptions. And out of all those items, these are the five that are costing you the most in excess inventory. These five items alone are costing you $287,000 in excess inventory. Almost 10% of your excess problem is not 2,000 items, it's these five. So if you do nothing else on a daily or weekly basis, but keep your eye on the five items that are on the list in each of these panels, you'll be able to address the items that have the biggest impact to your business and start to bring that inventory into balance. And if you notice for every item, you'll see a colored box with two letters. That's that item importance or classification that Russ mentioned. And this is a best practice in managing inventory. And what that is, is not all items contribute the same to your business. Some items contribute greater in value. Others contribute greater in inventory turns or volume. So by load da loading data from your ERP, along with some rules that you set up in the, your NetStock solution, we will be able to rank every item based on its value as an A, B, or a C item, and its turns as high, medium, or low. And that way you'll be able to set different policies, different replenishment policies, and you'll still be able to prioritize the ones that have the biggest impact to your business. But this panel is showing you where you have too much inventory right now. I want to move over to the next panel and give you a little more proactive heads up. Hey, here are some orders from your ERP. It could be purchase orders for supplied items, work orders for manufactured items, but there are 349 items on order. And when those orders arrive, they're gonna generate another 737,000 in excess inventory. So these would be some orders you might wanna review because they are candidates to maybe delay or cancel. So these first two panels are bringing to your attention where you have too much inventory. But right below that is the opposite. Are there any items you don't have enough of? And right now, according to your ERP, there's some items at this stocking location that you're out of. There are none in stock. In fact, there are 1,166 items with no inventory, but there's demand on those items. And you can't, you can't fulfill that demand until you replenish those items. And until you do, you could be at risk of losing sales and it could cost as much as $360,000. Doesn't mean you're gonna lose a sale, but you're at risk until you replenish. Again, I can look at all 1,166, but again, here are the top five. These five items alone are putting you at risk of 110,000 in potential lost sales. One third of that problem is not 1,100 items, it's these five. So these would be five items we highly recommend you pay some attention to. And then again, a little more proactive, here's some items that you're about to run out of. These are items that you do have some inventory today, but heads up, you're probably gonna run out before you can replenish. So day in the life of a planner, purchasing manager, production manager, executive, I can come in to the dashboard and I can very quickly see what my inventory is, what the planning tool recommends it should be. Where do I have too much inventory? 
What impact is it having on my business? Which are the most critical to pay some attention to? Are there any items I'm out of or about to run out of? What impact could it have on customer service or sales? Which are the most important to pay some attention to? So from here, I could do a lot of things, but let me drill into an item just to show you the fundamentals of how NetStock is doing its analysis. And so let's look at this, this item right up here, ST9501. Now, it is an A item that's high turning, and it looks like we may have some orders we don't need. And so by simply clicking on the item, it'll take me to the detail for this item. Now, the details there for every item on any given day, on any given um, uh, item, you may not need the detail, but it's there if you need it. And I just wanted to show you this because I want to show you the fundamentals of how NetStock is doing its analysis, how it came up with this solution or recommendation, and how you can use this information as to, to do some of the more strategic things that Russ was talking about. So first, we're looking at this SKU with this description at this stocking location. And according to your ERP, there are 2,154 units in stock. You have 329 that are not available. Maybe they didn't pass inspection or quarantine or they had a defect, which brings your available stock to 1825. You have, now in this case, purchase order, 566 units. And if I'd like to see more detail, we've pulled that in from your ERP. I can click on open POs and I can see more detail on any open purchase order. And that's gonna bring your inventory to 2391. But that's what your inventory is. The power of the planning tool is to recommend what your inventory should be and when you need to replenish. And that all happens over here on the right. And we're gonna look at it from two perspectives. First is demand. Pretty hard to determine what my inventory stocking level should be unless I know the demand moving forward. And the second is supply. Pretty hard to tell you what you should stock and when you should replenish unless I know how my suppliers are doing. So let's look at both of those, both from a, 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 from a risk perspective. And so let's generate a forecast. Pretty hard to determine what my inventory stocking levels should be unless I know my demand. Well, we will automatically load the sales history from your ERP. Now, this particular item had 26 months of sales history, and that's represented graphically in blue. And what NetStock is gonna do is it's gonna analyze that pattern in blue because we are going to determine which forecasting method is the best fit to predict future demand. And that's probably the hardest thing to do in a spreadsheet. There are dozens of forecasting methods. And which one should you use? And most of our customers tell us they kind of they default to a simple moving average. Well, we're going to test that sales history in blue, and we're going to pick the best forecasting method that will predict the best forecasting method into the future. And in this case, a linear trend was identified. Now, out of the box, we're going to forecast for the next 12 months. But with a lot of the challenges to the with the pandemic and the supply chain, we've had a lot of customers tell us that they need to plan over a longer horizon. So we've actually added an extension where we can plan for 24 months. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing a forecast for the next 24 months. But what we're going to do is we're going to take that forecast and we're going to, if I come down here to where it says forecast history, we can track how is that forecast doing against actual sales? And we can alert you to any item that is under or over forecasted. So we can, we can assess the risk of your forecast accuracy. We can alert you. You can go in and change that forecast, but a very robust forecast. Now, as I mentioned, the next thing we're gonna do is look at supplier performance. And this item, we are gonna look at it from several perspectives. And one of those is we're going to assign a target fill rate. And that is for what we want to stock for this item, we might we be, want to be more aggressive in setting a target for, in this case, an A item that's high turning. Because what we're trying to do is set up what's called a safety stock. And a safety stock is a buffer. And a buffer protects you from stocking out. You want enough inventory so that you don't stock out, but you don't want so much that you see excess but you want that buffer to protect you from some of the realities of the supply chain. Suppliers don't always deliver on time, don't always deliver the right quantity. And that is being exacerbated in the last 12 to 18 months with some of the supply chain challenges. And so we're gonna look at several dynamics to recommend that safety stock. And one of those is you might wanna set a more aggressive target to a more important item to your business. We're gonna look at the lead time. 
How long does it take to get this item from this supplier? Well, according to your ERP, it's 45 days. So when you place a purchase order on this SKU from this supplier, it should arrive in 45 days. But does it? How is this supplier do doing? What if they're always late? What if they never deliver the right quantity? Then that would, in that would imply that you should increase your safety stock. Well, let's assess that risk. Let's go back to ERP. Let's go get some more data. And let's pull it into our supplier performance panel. And I can see every transaction. I can see it graphically. Did the supplier deliver on time? Did they deliver the right quantity? Or I can see the actual transactions from your ERP because we pulled those in. And I can see every transaction you've made on this supplier. And it turns out that this supplier is not delivering to the stated lead time, which suggests then that we need to increase our safety stock. We'll do the same thing for the forecast. And in doing so, we're going to recommend for this SKU that you should keep 21 days of inventory as your minimum or safety stock level. Well, what does that mean? I want to know how much of this item to stock and when to replenish. Well, we now have a demand picture. We have a supply picture. And we're going to pull that into our policy panel, which is literally going to be the recommendation on what your inventory stocking levels should be. So as an example, we know your lead time is 45 days. But how many units do you need to cover 45 days of lead time? Well, it depends on that forecast over here in yellow. So based on that forecast, you need 1,010 units to cover 45 days of lead time. You need 486 units to cover 21 days of safety stock. So now in units, driven off that forecast in yellow, here is your recommended minimum stocking level, reorder point, and maximum stocking level. And we will calculate a minimum stocking level, a reorder point, and a maximum stocking level for every SKU at every location every day. And then we're going to compare that to what your inventory is. Well, remember, with what's on order, your inventory is going to be $23.91. That puts you above the maximum recommended stocking level. So what that says is, you're going to have more inventory than is the max, which will put you in an excess position. So what that says then is some of that 566 you don't need. 566 is going to bring you more than you need, so you might want to reduce that 566. In fact, there are 166 units more than you need. So you might want to go in, you might want to look at that open purchase order, and you might want to drop it by 166 units, and that's going to get you back in balance. But the point is, we're going to calculate a, a, a forecast, a safety stock, then turn that into a min, reorder point, and a max, compare it to your stock on hand for every item. And if you're above the max, we're going to flag it as excess. If you're above the max because you have open POs you don't need, we're going to flag that. If your inventory is below the reorder point, we'll flag that as an item you need to place an order on. So those are the fundamentals. But what we can do with those fundamentals is you can do some more strategic planning with that. So we're going to alert you to items that need attention. We're going to alert you to anything that you need to order. But what if you do need to change the forecast on this item? What if you do um, need to, to review the supplier performance of this item? So let's say over the next 12 to 24 months, you think uh, you're because of the recession, uh, that we're, we might be facing coming down the road, maybe I want to reduce the inventory on this item. Or maybe because of COVID, this item has a big run and I want to increase the inventory. So you could go in and you could change that forecast and you could see what that does to your, your, your replenishment uh, recommendations. Um, but you could also then go in and say, how does this project over the next 12 or 24 months? Because I have a forecast and I can take that forecast and I can map it to my mins and maxes and what I can do with that then is I can project that over the next 12 or 24 months. And what that means is I can see what we're going to recommend for this item over the next 12 to 24 months. So right now today, we have more inventory than we need and we have some orders we don't need. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get you back in balance. And balance means you receive an order just as you hit your minimum stocking level, bringing you back to your max. We're not there right now. We need to burn down some of that excess inventory, maybe cancel that, um, that order we don't need. But once we do, we're going to keep you at your mins and maxes. And this means I need to receive an order on this date for this amount to bring me back to my max. But the, what that means then is if I hit my order button, 
In the blue, here's when in advance you need to place this order so that it arrives right here. And what does that mean? Here are the recommended orders that we're recommending for this SKU for this supplier. And I could go in and I could change that forecast. I could rerun this and I could see what we're projecting you'll need for this item. And not only could you share that with your supplier for this SKU, but one of the things we've added is more of a strategic planning tool for the supplier review. And I could come over to this supplier and say, hey, don't just tell me what I'm projecting for this SKU. Tell me what my entire purchasing portfolio looks like for this supplier. And I'm going to click on the supplier. And I am now going to look at some, some basic stats we have on the supplier. But I'm going to come up to this supplier performance button. Because what that's going to do is it's going to show me every item we buy from this supplier. In fact, we buy 13 items from this supplier, not just the one we were looking at, but we buy 13. We are carrying $1.1 million of inventory. 206,000 of that is in safety stock. I can see how this supplier has been performing. We can see the average lead time. We can see historically what we've purchased from this supplier. Are there any overdue SKUs or items from this supplier? Are there any open purchase orders on this supplier? And what are we projecting in terms of time and value that we're going to buy from this supplier over the next 24 months? And I can see all of those graphically, or let's get a little more granular. Let's go look at those recommended future orders. Here is what we're recommending you order from the supplier, not just for one SKU, but for every SKU you buy from this supplier. I can see the projected orders we're recommending for this supplier. But let's look at it in even more detail. I'm going to come and show this in a table view. And I can look at it, and let's drill down one more time, and I'm going to see it summarized by month. Because we have that 24-month forecast, I can see this for the next 24 months, and I can see it by SKU that we buy from this supplier. And so this is by SKU, everything we're recommending, and when, broken out by month, we're recommending you order from this supplier. So this could be a very strategic planning tool to sit down with your supplier. And you could even take it one step further and say, hey, um, if we, we need to focus on one thing, what I really want to do is let's just at least focus on my A-only items. These are the most critical items to my business. Let's apply that filter. And now what I'm looking at is just my A items. And now you could sit down with that supplier and say, hey, based on my demand planning view, based on my, my projections of what my, my demand is going to be, here is what I'm projecting by SKU, the most important SKUs to my business that I'm going to buy for the next 12, 24 months. And here's what I'd like to focus with on you. Uh, and here's what I'm going to need you to, to be able to deliver for me. So this gives you just a very thorough supplier performance review. Now, the next thing I can do is let's look at it from more of a policy perspective. So I could come in to my forecast view. And instead of looking at a forecast from a single SKU perspective, I could look at a forecast across all my items. So don't just forecast across one view, one SKU, look at everything that I'm, 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 I'm stocking. And this is every the sales history for every SKU, the forecast across every SKU. But again, maybe I don't wanna look at every SKU, let's come filter. And maybe again, I just wanna look at my A items as an example. So let's just look at the list of items that are my A items. And now I'm just looking at that list of items and I could see the list. I could change each SKU individually. But what I could do is I could go in and I could change the forecast across a group of items. I could look at the entire group all in one place and make changes. But what I've done then is I've changed my forecast and I've set different policies. So an example, I've got a more aggressive uh, target fill rate for an A item. But what I wanna do is I wanna test those policies based on that projected forecast across this entire group of items. And so what I've done is I've gone to the projection button and I've actually rerun that because what we're going to do. So remember when I showed you that projection across one item, we're now going to do it across all of the items in that group. And what I can do is I can see what my policies are going to look like based on my A items, my high items. What policies have I set based on different groups of items? What forecast have I adjusted? So I could I could change a forecast. I could rerun the projection. And what this is showing me is based on my demand, based on my, my policies, we are projecting that you're going to actually reduce your inventory over the next 24 months from 8.7 to 5.7. You're going to increase your fill rate. You're going to improve your turns. 
Here's what that demand picture looks like. But again, I could go in and I could change that and then rerun this projection. But here's what we're projecting. We're projecting your recommended orders are gonna drop a little bit. And here's when you need to receive those items. So what this is, is more of a strategic view. Again, we plan at the item at, by location level, but I can then bring that up to a higher level and forecast across the entire group of items. I can, I can project across an entire group of items. So from more of a strategic perspective, I could see what that does to my investment, what that's going to do to my um, uh, uh, different policies. So we're gonna recommend, so just a quick summary. We are going to show you what your inventory is. We're gonna recommend what it should be. We're gonna highlight which items need your attention the most so that you can focus on those items so that at a SKU level, you can, you can plan what items to stock, when to buy, but at a more um, a strategic level, we can then look at across all of your items we can recommend what your policies are gonna look like so you can shape and manipulate your policies, adjust your forecasts as uh, real dynamics in your supply chain change. So a very powerful tool, easy to roll out. Um, but Russ, Michael, let me stop there. I am going to uh, stop sharing. Um, and uh, uh, Russ and Michael, let me turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Tom. That was a great presentation there, walking us through all the, or at least some of the capabilities. I know there's um, even more behind the scenes, but, uh, you know, at least a, a great overview of uh, what's capable within your tool. Russ, did you have any uh, comments before we uh, look at some questions? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts, I guess. I mean, I think the key for the audience here is to think about it. And as you uh, kind of introduced early on, Michael, right, you've got a great foundation in your Dynamics ERP already, right? It's doing a great job of capturing all the transactions, all the movement, giving you accurate and timely understanding of where you stand today. Um, uh, but where's the gap, right? The gap in that system is that standard reports and standard uh, you know, purchase <clears throat> reports and so forth and, and lead times that are not dynamic and, and other static data that sits in an inventory master file just is not adequate anymore, right? I used to be a, a reselling partner myself. I had my own business uh, like Paradigm for uh, 15 years, started a couple of them and, and for about 25 years overall working in other firms as well. And, you know, when we implemented an ERP application, it was a lot of work. We'd spend all this time and energy putting in master file data like uh, mins and maxes and lead times and and sometimes safety stocks and and EOQs and things like that. And you know, you know, back in those days, 10, 15 years ago, you know, that data was good for about six or nine or 12 months, and then you'd have to dump it all out to Excel, right? You'd go through a process of figuring out how to update it and get it to current state. Uh, today, the with the volatility the way it is, that data is good for about a week. Uh, and it becomes obsolete and useless. So if, unless you have a dynamic tool that's taking all that great raw data and, and all those transaction histories that the ERP is capturing, but now leveraging that to do really good analytics and what if and understanding and really get the visibility, unless you're really doing that today, you're behind the eight ball and your competitors are doing it, uh, right? And, and sometimes now your competitors are big box players themselves, right? Home Depot and so forth. If you're in the building material supply business, those guys are, are going big B2B. It's not just a retail walk-in, uh, right? So your competitors are strong. And if you want to thrive and survive, and the, you know, the, the companies that we target with this application are what we call challenger firms, right? These are firms that are growing. They're aggressive. They want to grow. They want to be the best out there. Uh, and if you want to be, if that's you, if that's who you want to be in your marketplace, you absolutely have to invest in tools like this to help you manage the, the, the craziness in the market. So those are hopefully as people were watching and listening, uh, that's kind of what the sense that they're getting it. You know, they've got a good foundation, but it's not enough today. And, and, and there is a better way to take it to the next level. Yeah, that's great points. Great points, Russ. Um, I did see one question come in, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of expand upon it. There was a, a pretty simple question, but I'm going to kind of expand right. upon it a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, you guys, there, there's a lot of things going on in, in, within your product. So, you know, somebody looking at it, they might think, oh my God, you know, 
this thing's going to take forever to implement and for, you know, it's going to take, a, you know, forever for me to, to be able to see results out of this. So can you yeah. kind of talk about how long, you know, an implementation and how quickly people, you know, could accept, expect to see uh, sure. valuable information out of it? As you know, the reality is we don't exist in a silo or in some sort of vacuum, right? Companies have lots going on in their organizations. They've got other projects that they're probably talking to you about, right? Do I need to do CRM? Do I need to do other BI stuff? Do I need to do other enhancements in my application? So, so there's a lot of competing interests out there. And so it's, it's important to understand kind of where this can fit uh, and how you could prioritize it. And the good news is that this is one that's actually very rapidly deployed. Uh, we've got a very standard methodology that we've developed. We, you know, we have well over 2,000 customers now around the globe using this product. We're, we're putting in dozens a month. Uh, and so we have a really solid uh, methodology that's proven and tested and successful. Uh, and so it can go very quickly. This, you know, the fastest I've seen in implementation is two weeks. Uh, but I oh, wouldn't wow. recommend it. Uh, uh, it. More typically for a typical distribution business, I think we're looking at probably six to eight weeks. If you've got some manufacturing going on with bills and materials uh, and some of that that we need to manage, or if your supply chain is more complex, then maybe that increases by a few weeks. Maybe we're more like 10, 12 weeks uh, to get fully live and operational. But, you know, we have a, this is a, the installation is the easy part, right? And it, it installs in a matter of an hour and you've got a dashboard. But now the challenge becomes, okay, what is, does that dashboard reflect my reality, right? How do I refine that? How do I want to think about my inventory? Do I have certain buyers, certain product lines, certain things that I want to slice and dice and have that dashboard represent certain aspects or pieces of my overall data environment? Um, what am I responsible for as a user and so forth? So we work closely with an individual in the company when we deploy it. We do coaching. There's a lot of stuff that just comes out of the box, right? 80-20 rule type of things that that get you started. But then we, we've got lots of different parameters and levers that we can tweak to have it mold itself to your particular needs. So that's really what we call the refinement phase. And that's really where the bulk of the work is. And, you know, you're probably looking at 40 hours of worth of investment maybe on the customer side. And so you spread those 40 hours or so across six to eight weeks. You can see that it's a manageable burden gives you time to play and mess around. You can't screw up the data. You know, we, all, we can always refresh the data from the source, which is the ERP. So uh, you can be pretty fearless in there, go in and, and play around uh, and uh, try some stuff and learn. We've got coaching sessions that are scheduled. We've got lots of self-paced learning videos and other coursework and so forth that people can go back and review multiple times if necessary at their, at their leisure, at their pace. So we've really made it a, an environment that's easy uh, to get people up and running, they can go quickly. We won't hold them up, uh, but typically a pace is you know six to eight weeks. Does that help? Yeah, it's great. And I think you know one of the important things is that um, you know sometimes we see on a on an ERP implementation, you know that people go in and they do the implementation and it's working and you know, they feel that, okay, we're, we're getting the information out, we're getting our financial statements out, or, you know, we're paying yep. our bills and things like that. Yep. This type of a system is really different from that. It's something that you really yep. need to pay attention to. You need to, you know, if, if, if you're going to make the investment in, in getting the tool, you're going to need to make the, the investment in the time to make sure you keep up with it and actually use the information that's coming out of the system. You know, don't make it static and just let it sit there. It's something you you need to kind of be working with and, and molding and, and you know, using yeah, uh, yeah. constantly. Yeah, you bet. I mean, if, if you go to our, our website at netstock.com, you'll see success stories and some video uh, testimonials and so forth. And, and people will consistently talk about how, the NetStock dashboard is on their screen all day, every day, right? It's the first thing they do when they check in. In fact, they might be looking at it on their iPad from the breakfast table before they even go to the to the, to the factory or the or the warehouse. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's something that's present all day, every day because it's so dynamic, right? It's so important, uh, and every day is a fresh. And even if you need to refresh it during the day, you can certainly do that. Typically, we're scheduling to update the data every every night. 
uh, for planning purposes, that's more than adequate. But you know, you you could if you had some significant event, you could refresh the data in 20 minutes. You've got a fresh dashboard and and see what that looks like. So, but yeah, it needs to become part of the it, and it does become part of the everyday process for those folks that are responsible for this in the organizations. Anybody that's doing buying and planning, managing of inventory, the dashboard is open all day long. Yep, and they're looking at it all the time. All right. Well, I think at this point. Um... First of all, thank you, Russ and Tom, for your time today and, and taking us through this. And, and hopefully, you know, anybody who has viewed this will be able to, uh, you know, get some thoughts going in their in their head. Um, so with that, how how pe how can people get a hold of you, Russ? Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly happy to take a direct uh, inquiry um, and just my email is russ at netstock.co. Um, our website is now .com, but our email addresses are still .co, at least for the uh, for a short period. We just recently acquired that .com URL and domain name. Uh, but, but it might make more sense, Michael, just for folks to reach out to you uh, and have that first conversation and you can direct them to us. I and mean, we're always happy to chat with them, but, but I think your role as their partner is critical in this whole process, right? You know, their businesses very well. Uh, and I think the first conversation, to be honest with you, should probably be with you. Uh, and then you could direct them to us, but we're more than happy to have a individual conversation. Tom and I can get on a, get on a zoom meeting or whatever, a team's meeting and, and, uh, understand uh, you know a company's individual needs and requirements and see where we fit and how we could help and always happy to do that yep great and and yeah i apologize that's kind of what i meant was uh, you know um you know reach out to us and and yeah. you know we can kind of talk you through but uh you know you guys have a lot of resources on your website so we do uh, you know go to the uh to your website there to kind of see some more information and, and possibly get some more information about the, the product. But yes, certainly, you know, reach out to us, uh, you know, at, at sales at ptcsolutions.com. And, uh, you know, we'd be more than happy to, to walk you through and, and talk you through some of the, uh, the requirements there. And, and, you know, then once we kind of go through that, then we can get Russ and Tom and his group, their group involved and, and yep. taking the next steps so yep uh, you bet we'd love to do it all right with that uh i will thank everybody for their time today and again uh you know this is michael gummel from paradigm technology consulting uh, any questions please feel free to reach us at sales at ptcsolutions.com or go to our website ptcsolutions.com and again russ one last play, peg for your website there yep netstock.com all right. Very good. So again, thank you everybody for your time today. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you. Thanks, Michael.